Well, hello everyone, and we have now arrived in Rome. And when one thinks of Rome, one thinks of grandeur, one thinks of magnificence, one thinks of this um, tremendous, huge, multicultural empire that span uh, the distance between the Atlantic Ocean and the Caspian Sea from uh, Britannia to Egypt. One rarely thinks of something like this one usually thinks of this, because this is Rome in the early 2nd century at its height, at its greatness. But the fact is, it did begin like this. Uh, according to archaeologists, there might have been a little village there in uh, around 800 BC, and this is where fact and fiction are blended, because according to later Roman historians, and we shouldn't forget that the Roman history will not be written until the first century BC, at the end of the first century BC, in other words, 800 years after its possible foundation, if there was an actual foundation rather than just an organic appearance of a settlement, which will later grow. But according to legend, those were Romulus and Remus with their band of vagabonds who founded a settlement around 800 BC. Consequently, Romulus will kill Remus, who was his brother. Then uh, he'll become the first king, then his successor will be kings. Uh, there'll be seven kings altogether, presumably, but we should think of them more as of tribal leaders than kings. And then the last three kings will in fact be Etruscans. And then circa 500, all the dates are very relative, just so you could remember them. And then circa 500, uh, the last king will be deposed and a republic will be established. In our study of Rome, there'll be two periods. The first period from about 500 to about the year zero, again, very approximate, it's a republic from about the year zero to about 500 AD, again approximate, it is an empire. Except in our case, in the case of art history, we'll be talking more about empire than republic, a little bit about the republic, because there was really, there were no arts. This is what it was. It was, uh, they came out of nowhere. They had no culture. They had no past. Uh, we're talking about the year about 800 BC. By this time, Egypt had seen its magnificence. So did Mesopotamia, Syria, Palestine. By now, Greece is now is now embarking on its uh, archaic, geometric, then archaic period. Rome is nothing. Rome is just a little village. In the north, they have the Etruscans which soon enough will be a fairly advanced civilization. In the south, they'll have the Greeks. In the middle, they have nothing. They do have a tribe of Sabines. They have uh, some other tribes around them who are more advanced than they are. They, however, this is how they live. Model of the village of Romulus on the Palatine Hill. And this model can be found in uh, Musee Nazionale delle Terme in Rome, a wonderful museum, absolutely no crowds, while all the crowds are now in the Sistine Chapel and there is no room to move. Uh, this particular museum near Termini is absolutely brilliant, very remarkable, has fantastical things, and not a soul. You'll have the museum all to yourself. Well, when things open up, of course. Uh, this is what uh, this little village will become uh, within 800 years. It will take a while, but uh, it will get there. However, most of its construction will in fact start after 800 years. Because until then, even in the first century BC, it was mud brick. The whole city was built of mud brick. There was no marble on the Italian peninsula, or rather there will be marble, but it will not be discovered, the quarries, until the time of Augustus, towards the end of the first century. So whatever marble will be used before this time will be brought at great expense from Greece 
and, uh, and other stones, again at great expense, from Egypt. Rome has mud. And now we begin. The, um, the first 500 years of the Republic produced a sturdy, no-nonsense race. It's almost as if Rome grew despite itself. Uh, they, uh, from the very early on, they were, uh, they were stubborn, they were, uh, they were confident, they knew, they must have known, they had greatness in them because, because greatness did come to them. And um, from the establishment of the Republic around 500, and then fast forward a couple of hundred years, there'll be all sorts of historical developments and the war between uh, the plebeians and, uh, and the patricians. But by uh, the third century BC, there'll be uh, the Etruscans will be absorbed pretty much. Uh, the entire Italian peninsula pretty much will be absorbed by the Romans. War will start with Sicily, which was Greek, and Sicily will be won over, and Rome will be ready to march forward. Meanwhile, as I said, it produced a race of, uh, of very, um, well, Spartan, even, even though they weren't Spartan, the Greeks were Spartan, but nevertheless, by their nature, they were a Spartan race. They were disdainful of luxuries, they were disdainful of comforts, and they liked it this way. They, uh, they admired masculine virtue, and what they meant by that was uh, honor, masculinity, fight, victory, these uh, sort of things. They were a very male-dominated society. It was um, definitely patriarchy. A patriarch had absolute power. He had the life and death of uh, his family in his hands. He also was incredibly proud of his ancestry. And to that point, and to that purpose, any time anyone died, in, particularly in patrician families, a death mask was taken off his face, and those masks in plaster were kept in the family and then marble busts or limestone busts, if marble was too expensive, were made of those plaster casts. Yet when that patrician would uh, go out on some serious mission or there'd be a festival, he would carry those plaster masks with him, as you see it here, in the marble sculpture. This is a marble sculpture of a patrician carrying the uh, masks of his ancestors to prove his greatness. Because nothing proves greatness better than the great deeds of one ancestors. And here you have it. Now from these masks evolved a tradition of uh, realistic portraiture, of veristic portraiture as it will be called. And as such, we have it. As you remember, with the Greeks, classical Greeks didn't really care about portraiture, certainly could never separate uh, a body from its head, because to the Greeks, just as in life, it would be impossible. Uh, the person would be dead. So in marble, because they didn't really make a difference, everything that they did, they understood holistically, it was impossible to separate a marble head from a marble body because then a sculpture would be dead. However, the Greeks develop uh, a very advanced, very, as I said, holistic, very intuitive way of depicting a human body, which Romans never will. But the Romans will always, always uh, be able to do these portrait heads. They, they will not always want to do it, but certainly in the Republic they did, because these heads were in fact copies of the, um, of the funeral masks. And here you have them, they were not attached to the bodies, they were just the uh, portrait heads. 
and they were proud of their wrinkles. They couldn't care less about classical idealistic beauty. Not yet. They will, but not yet. These honest men, men for whom duty was far more, more important than, than their personal feelings, than uh, their wives, than their families, duty was all. Their lives were dedicated to their duty. That's why I called them sort of Spartans in the beginning. Every wrinkle counted, because that was experience. They very much believed, until they are about 20, God gave their youthful faces their beauty. But after about 30, 35, they have to deserve it. They have to deserve what they look like. And uh, this is what they depict right here. Every wrinkle, as I said, depicted experience. They did not appreciate smooth, uh, pretty faces, because to them it meant nothing. Smooth, pretty faces conveyed no experience, no character, uh, no possibility. Now, these faces were interesting. Here's uh, another uh, example of three faces. Just imagine being married to this one. Uh, I could think of better things. But uh, this is supposed to be Pompeii, actually. And in this case, we can actually believe that these are real portraits. Because with Hellenistic Greece, even when we saw a realistic portrait in the case of, say, Alexander the Great, we know that that portrait was done 200 years after his death, so it could not possibly be a realistic portrait. Pompeii actually kind of looks like the nicest of the I know, right? horrible bunch, which makes sense because when Pompeii married the daughter of Julius Caesar, Julia, by all accounts, he was a really loving husband to her. I know, it, right? It yes. wasn't until Julia died that the alliance between Julius Caesar and Pompeii fell apart. Fell apart. And by this portrait, I mean, he looks like such a friendly potato. <laughs> I know he does. So, amazingly. Yeah, but my God. Look Not at this that one. one. No. Not that he one. definitely has the face he deserves. That, exactly. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> that is true. So, and here you have the difference. This is what was important to the Greeks, even though these are both copies, as you know. But this is what was important to the Greeks. Beautiful musculature, beautiful human body as it reflects the, the beauty of the universe, the uh, great potential of humanity in terms of achievement. We appreciate what was important to the Greeks. We do. <laughs> we very much do that. And how. And how. I have my audience here, which I'm very grateful for, because it's very difficult to talk to no audience. And this time I'm very lucky, not only I have my daughter Sasha, but I also have her best friend with us. And uh, we're all sort of participating in, um, in this lecture. So this is what was important to the Romans. This is what was important to the Greeks. Philosophy. Philosophy, abstract beauty, human potential. This was what was important to the Romans. Experience and achievement. And that's, and they, that's how they will differ. This, we saw it in our Etruscan lecture. This is our Arrigatori, the orator, an Etruscan work, because remember, even though this is the early 1st century BC, the Etruscans by now have been absorbed by the, um, by the Romans. Nevertheless, they still retain their skills, they retain their traditions, and when the Romans want something to be done really well, they call on the Etruscans um, to do it. Uh, here... The, uh, let's go back here, uh, and this is our orator, and unlike the refers, where contraposto was extremely important, the whole attitude of beauty and balance and harmony was important, not for the Romans. This is what was important for the Romans. Forget the contraposto, even though it's still there a little bit. I mean, we can see that his weight is placed on his right leg, the right hip is actually slightly raised, uh, and uh, the left leg is sort of free, but awkwardly so. What's important is the image of a man who is an orator, who knows how to speak to the public, whose public speech is brilliant, who can convince the public. This is the Republic. One must be convinced. And in this case, interestingly, the face goes with the body. Because later on, the Romans will stick sort of portraiture faces on the idealistic Greek bodies, and that will not look very good. 
but in this case, it does. Uh, the, uh, we have just fast forwarded 800 years from the year 800 to uh, the first century BC, and the reason for that was because Rome didn't have any art. And uh, ours is a lecture on art that had plenty of history. Goodness, by this time, they are masters of the Mediterranean. They don't have Egypt yet, but Greece is theirs, Syria is theirs, uh, Britain is not, but soon to be. So even though technically they are not an empire yet, they do have an empire. And the very first emperor will be called Augustus. He's Octavian Augustus. His first name is Octavian. He is uh, a nephew, a couple of times removed, of Julius Caesar. And when Julius Caesar is assassinated in the year 44 BC on the Ides of March, which is the 15th of March, his will will then be open, and in that will he will name uh, his nephew Octavian as his successor and thus automatically he will become the strongest man in the ancient world. With time he will be acclaimed Augustus as the all-powerful and he will rule for something like 50 years. Uh, let's see. Yeah, about that time. Uh, this is a very interesting uh, sculpture because what you have here in fact is a combination of Greek and Roman. Underneath here, just strip off his armor, you will see the riffers, or at least an attempt at the riffers. But that's not really what's important, besides the Romans, the Republican Romans, will greatly disapprove of the homoerotic culture of the Greeks. And um, it will not be until the imperial time when they will start appreciating it better. Here is Octavian, he is wearing his armor, he is wearing his cape, and uh, it's a combination of the refers and then the orator, because he is an orator, he is del delivering a speech. As such, the entire contraposta, the entire balance and harmony of our de refers is compromised. Romans don't care, because Augustus was a very clever man, didn't like to fight much. He preferred diplomacy. And what happened by this time is that um, a former general went east to former Persia, and now it's the Parthian Empire, and Rome will always have problems with the Parthian Empire in the east. But the former general lost the standards, lost the colors, the Roman colors to the Parthians. That was a great dishonor. What Augustus managed to do now is to get back those standards, to get back those colors without shedding uh, a drop of blood. But uh, obviously the Romans themselves, they have no idea what went on. There, is no, there are no televisions, there, there is no internet. For all they know is that Augustus's valiant troops went to Parthia and fought them and conquered them and got back the standards. So that's what you see on his cuirass, on his armor. The uh, Parthians and the Romans, the giving back of, um, of the standards. According to the cuirass? Go ahead. You could say that the Parthian now respects the Roman. <laughs> ah! Leave it to my daughter. As we saw before, this is uh, a marble sculpture must always have support. And this is a marble sculpture, and what we have for support is a little cupid. And uh, therein lies um, another interesting story, because Augustus is an adopted son of Julius Caesar. He then claims the same descent as Julius Caesar. Now, the line of the Julii, goes back to a hero, Aeneas, who was the only one of uh, the princes of Troy who was able to escape Troy with his retainers and was predicted to found a new Troy, a new Troy on the Italian peninsula. 
So Rome will always consider itself or herself as the new Troy because Aeneas ultimately will reach the Italian peninsula and then Romulus and Remus will be his descendants and they will found the new Troy and Julius Caesar and hence the name Julius because Aeneas' son's name was Julius. They claim their descent directly from Troy. And uh, Aeneas was the son of the goddess Aphrodite. Another son of the goddess Aphrodite is Cupid. And that's what you see here. So the Cupid now acts as he has two roles. One, he is support for a very heavy marble sculpture. Secondly, he reminds everyone, not that anybody needed reminding because at that time everybody knew about it, but nevertheless uh, remind everyone that Augustus is a cousin of Cupid and thus they are both related to the goddess Aphrodite. Augustus was also the high priest and as a high priest we have his uh, togate sculptures where he wears the toga of a high priest right here. The statue portrays Augustus as the Pontifex Maximus. This is where the Roman Pope, of course, gets his name. Chief priest of the state. The emperor thereby emphasized his peaceful role and his position as the intermediary between the Roman people and the gods. Very important. And as the intermediary, and as uh, a person of peace, and it will so happen that Augustus will establish about 200 years of peace, because the entire first century BC was civil wars. What happened to Rome was, uh, Rome was so busy uh, conquering, and then they conquered all they could, or almost all they could, that by the end of the uh, second century BC, they turned onto each other and horrible civil wars began. And then Julius Caesar was able in the second part of the first century BC to calm things down, to re-establish peace, administration, also to fill up the treasury again. He was on the way of making Rome great while because of the civil wars, Rome almost fell apart. However, after his death, after he was assassinated, another set of civil wars began. And that will not end until 31 BC. So between 44, 31, that's 13 years again of civil wars. The entire first century BC, nothing but civil wars. And finally, under Augustus, things will come down. He obviously wasn't uh, privileged to know it, but uh, he will establish peace that will last, well, more or less, for the next 200 years. And without even knowing, nevertheless, uh, the Ara Pacis Augustae was, uh, was, it was commissioned by the Senate of Rome, but also with the knowledge and support of Augustus' very intelligent wife by the name of Livia. And, um, it took between 13 uh, BC and uh, 9 BC to construct. Here, fortunately, it was found. It was found in the 19th century and uh, in pieces, then rebuilt, as you see it here, and placed in uh, its own space, a modern space. Uh, this is Augustus's wife, uh, Livia and she supports the latest Roman hairdo. But now that we are entering the imperial age, there'll be uh, less interest in vericity, and there'll be less interest in portraying one space, certainly among the emperor and his retinue, in portraying them as they actually looked. Augustus, what we see as we see him here, he will li live till 70-something. And Livia, I think, will live till almost 90. In their sculptures, they'll never change. They will always look youthful. So they'll go back to this idealistic representation that uh, the Greeks liked so much. 
same face, looks, what, late 20s. Uh, and uh, so the auto patches. It was found, it was put together, it was placed uh, right here. We had, uh, we had seen altars before. Uh, you had seen the altar of Pergamon, uh, for instance. This is a much smaller version, but it's the same idea. There is an altar inside the uh, walls, and that's the altar that was um, active and used, and then the marble wa walls uh, surrounded the altar, as, as you see in this uh, example. By the time of Augustus, Italians will discover marble quarries in Carrara, in the uh, northwest of Italy. And Augustus will, in fact, later boast that he inherited Rome of brick, but he will leave Rome of marble, which he will. And then after him, the building of Rome will expand exponentially because every succeeding emperor will want to add his... Uh, quota to the building of Rome and ultimately, yes, by the uh, by mid-2nd century, Rome will be this spectacular city of marble, emulating the uh, such cities as Ephesus or Pergamon or Alexandria, of course, in Egypt and, uh, and Athens as well. But uh, back to our, the, the Arapaches means uh, the uh, Ara is the altar and Pachis is the genitive of peace. So the, and Agasta again, the genitive of Augustus. So it is the altar of the peace of Augustus. And here we have it, right there. There's the altar itself, the altar proper, as it is surrounded by these walls. Uh, there are actually steps on each side. And uh, I didn't find uh, a better slide, but this is what we have. It is covered, the outside walls are covered with marble reliefs. And while at the bottom, on the uh, lower uh, story, on the lower register, it's uh, tendrils and acanthus leaves and then, uh, uh, and then some little crickets and animals. But then on the upper register, that is more interesting, on each side, here and there, these are procession, the actual procession of Augustus and his retinue. And then on the other sides, there are representations of Roma herself, so to speak, and also representations from Roman history. To us, it's mythology. To them, it was history. And thus we have it. Here's the procession of uh, the priests and the imperial family. Then on the other, and the same thing there. Here and there. Then on this side, we have, um, well, what's left of it. Not much is left of it. But there is uh, a remnant of a representation of uh, the discovery of Romulus in Remus. Because Romulus and Remus, uh, as in many other mythologies, were abandoned, uh, put in a basket, sent down the Tiber, but then a she-wolf presumably found the two boys and fed them to health. And then a shepherd found them, and then after that they were brought up by the shepherd and his wife. Then on this side is uh, Aeneas, the, uh, uh, the prince who escaped from Troy, who finally reached the Italian peninsula, and as he reached the peninsula he is sacrificing to the gods for fortunate landing. So that's on this side and on the other sides there is the allegory of Rome or the allegory of the earth. Well, Rome was the earth by this time. And uh, then the allegory of Rome as a she-warrior. And here we have it. This is a restoration. All the color is gone, just as was the case in Greece. Egypt, I mean, color is gone. We don't have color. But this, presumably, what the color did look like. And here is the imperial procession, right here, which is of greatest, greatest hi historical importance, because, in fact, the emperor himself, his wife, his children, his generals, his priests, they're all portrayed there. The bottom row, as I said, acanthus leaves, tendrils, uh, there are swans there, 
one could find little frogs, butterflies, what have you. But that's on the lower register. They'll go later on the inside and there they're just garlands with the skulls of bullocks. And then here is the case where this is Aeneas. As he reached the Italian shore, he is sacrificing to the gods and there is um, a representation of a temple. Obviously it's all in a different scale, but whoever saw it understood what that was all about. And there, I don't know if you can see it very well, but when you get your PowerPoints you can see it better. Also, obviously, you can look it up online. There's a she-wolf right there with the two babies and a shepherd looking at them. Uh, and here, what it looks like today. This survived, so there's Aeneas with some of his followers. And there's the representation of the temple. And uh, there's a pig about to be sacrificed. Uh, on the other side now, the goddess Roma as a warrior goddess did not survive very well. But uh, the goddess Roma as the goddess Talos as the earth or as an allegory of peace, she survived magnificently. And uh, here we have her sitting in the middle as this great Roman matron with uh, cloth around her head. On her knees are two babies, Romulus and Remus, that would make sense, right? And on each side is, on the one side is the allegory of the sea, and every time you see this blowing uh, cape around a head of uh, a female representation, in most cases that means an allegory. And here she rides some sort of a sea creature, a sea dragon, and he is completely obedient. So she is the representation of peace at sea. On the other hand is a representation of also uh, a nude female who is flying atop uh, a swan. And she is representation, the representation of uh, the um, peace in the air. Well, obviously they didn't have aircraft at that point. But what, what's meant here is that peace everywhere. And indeed, the peace in the sea is most important because piracy is uh, as uh, ancient as any other ancient profession. And what will happen under the Romans is that um, Pompey the Great will free the Mediterranean from the pirates and uh, will uh, open the seas to trade, which was extremely important. So peace was very important for prosperity. It was the case then, <laughs> it's the case today. This is what presumably it looked like in color. And on the other side, right here, here we have a bit of a reconstruction. Uh, Roma as a warrior. In other words, peace is extremely valuable and peace must be maintained at all costs, even if the cost is war. And that's what uh, is, meant, uh, is meant here. Uh, the animals, again, are all in peace. They are well fed. They are ready to be sacrificed. It's a, very <laughs> it's a very nice allegory, though, that long after war has been eroded, peace survives. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Even in terms of the, the piece of work itself. Yeah, it's the very work true. Itself. By this time, no Roman cities had fortifications. I even mean today. I even mean today, well, yes. the fact that the sculpture of war oh, right, of has course. been eroded, but peace survives and is maintained in Italy. I mean, that's nice. That's yeah, a lovely absolutely. message to carry through the ages. It is. Yeah. Uh, so this is our Arapaches. Now, now we go to the imperial procession and why it is so important. Because here, their representations of, uh, of a number of the imperial family, and some of them have been recognized. I know you cannot see them here, but you will be able to see them, of course, in your PowerPoint. And um, unfortunately, in fact, Augustus himself is not very well preserved. Well, his face is preserved. And then follow Agrippa, he is his great general. And then Livia, his wife, Tiberius, the Livia's son, and then various other members of the imperial family. 
this kind of representation will be of incredible importance for, uh, for art history. Because the idea ultimately is the same as the Panathenaic procession in Athens, and the same kind of frieze. And of course they were familiar with Panathenaic procession because by that time Greece was theirs. Except when with Phidias, who was the sculptor of the Parthenon, everybody had enough room to move and breathe because, again, to the Greeks, balance and harmony were very important and, and measure. Romans, less important. It's much more important for them to show as many people as possible. And if they appear crowded, well, so be it. They still appear quite naturalistic. They all were, they're all togate reliefs. They're all wearing their togas, women wearing their dresses. And what's very unusual is that there are a number of children that are represented here, and children really were not represented in the past. And the reason for that is because um, Augustus was concerned uh, with uh, the accumulation of wealth. The, <laughs> the wealthy families actually didn't want to have as many children and didn't want to have as many responsibilities. And uh, as a result, uh, the, uh, the birth rate among patricians was dropping. And uh, Augustus was concerned about it and promulgated a number of laws to encourage the patricians to marry early and to have many children. And that's why we see children here, because this uh, all was very much encouraged. And uh, here again, these are the Flaminis, which were the priests at the time. Uh, and then there's some lictors. Lictors were bodyguards. A lictor's bodyguard, uh, a Flamini is a priest. Inside, and again, this was also all covered, this is the altar itself. Now, you must understand, all of this was reconstructed, rebuilt uh, steps. You see them, they look very new. It's because they are. It's because the old ones crumbled. Uh, but everything, everywhere, you see these signs of age. That's real. And then the garlands here, and... Uh, the skulls of the bullocks, because a number of bullocks were in fact sacrificed on this altar. Towards the end of his life, before his death, Augustus actually wrote an autobiography, the uh, a story of his deeds, uh, the deeds of the divine Augustus, Res Gestae Divi Augusti. Uh, it is a funerary inscription of Augustus giving a first-person record of his life and accomplishment. Which is, which is really remarkable, because we don't, well, we have Caesar's, of course, Gallic Wars, but something so consistent we don't have. This is the first time. And it is especially significant because it gives an insight into the image Augustus portrayed to the Roman people. It doesn't mean this is the actual image of Augustus as he was, but even the fact that we know the image he wished to portray is also very important because he felt this was good for Rome and what was good for Rome good for everybody else. It was discovered the inscription is a monument to the establishment of the Julia Claudian dynasty that was to follow Augustus. Because Augustus comes from the Julian dynasty he marries Livia who comes from the Claudians who were the Sabines the dynasty will be called the Julian Claudian dynasty. Various portions of uh, this autobiography have been found in modern Turkey and here, as you see it, and the scholars were able to reconstruct it. Uh, today, on this, uh, this is the modern building that houses the Arapache, and here, right there, one is be able, well, if one knows Latin, one is able to read the whole thing as it was written. It's really actually very fascinating to see photographs of 20th century Italians chiseling in the words of quote-unquote the divine Augustus from first century uh, Rome. Uh -huh. And that's just really fascinating to see how he wanted his word to endure and it uh, did. Yeah, he wanted his words written in stone and here they are. I mean, we don't have too many, uh, too many art historical objects from the time of Augustus. So whatever we have, we are very grateful. 
and one of them is this uh, extraordinary uh, low relief cameo. It is a cameo which is sort of a relief on the, on the precious stone. And it is an engraved gem cut from a double layered Arabian onyx stone. It is commonly agreed that the gem cutter who created the Gemma Augustea was either Dioscurides or one of his disciples in the second or third decade of the first century AD. In other words, it's after the death of Augustus, but close enough that uh, the spirit still lives on and that we can consider it the uh, piece inspired by Augustan reign. And what it is here, it's divided again into two registers. And in the top registers sits Augustus with the goddess Roma, right here. This is after his death, so it must have been carved under Tiberius. Tiberius, who succeeded Augustus as emperor. And here we see Tiberius himself as he descends from this brilliantly foreshortened chariot driven by the goddess of victory and looks over to the divine Augustus because the moment Augustus was dead, he was deified and became God. Here is uh, an eagle which usually is uh, an emblem of Zeus and thus there is a correlation between the great god and the great emperor. On the lower portion you see his victories or victories that happened under Augustus. And uh, here are the Romans. The barbarians always look disheveled with huge beards. Uh, Romans shaved at that time. And uh, here are the husband and wife, presumably. Here also is a husband, the same husband and wife. It's a narrative, uh, it's a narrative relief. And here are the Romans who are raising, they've captured the standards of the barbarians and they are raising the standards. Augustus has uh, a sign of Capricorn, which is the sign of his birthday. And then with Tiberius, something that looks like a cancer, that would be his birthday. Uh, here is Augustus, the Capricorn, right here. And this was on one of the uh, coins. And this is the bottom uh, section. And you see husband and wife. Now, if you remember the Narma palette with which we began <laughs> this semester, you may remember that Narma is holding his enemy by the forelock. And this was uh, a sign of universal submission or, on the other hand, of conquest. And we see the same here. The Romans are doing the same. They are holding the barbarians by the forelock. And here are the two barbarians. They are captured. They are tied up while the Romans are lifting uh, the standards. Another interesting example that comes from uh, those days, uh, it is dated to about uh, 80 to 7 BC, is a temple of Portunus, or a temple of Fortuna Virilis, which is masculine virtue, or Portunus, the temple of the gates, because this temple sat and still sits right on the Tiber. And it is possible that captains and sailors, before they left Rome for distant lands, would go there and pray for good weather and, uh, and fortunate sailing. And then, if they came from elsewhere to Rome, again, they would go there and pray for safe delivery. And uh, what we see here immediately is the Etruscan temple, of course, as we saw before. Um, the Romans had made certain, well, improvements, shall we say. Uh, the the uh, porch is a little smaller than your typical Etruscan porch, because the porch is half of the cellar. But what they do now, again, just as they combine the, uh, uh, the arigatori with uh, our spear bearer, they are now combining the Etruscan temple with the Greek temples. They, they're too practical, they're too pragmatic a people. They do not want to surround the entire temple with freestanding columns because they just see no reason for it. No reason, no reason aesthetically, no reason, in, certainly not in terms of expense or labor. 
but what they do do, they decorate it. They do decorate side walls and back wall, as you see, with the same Ionian columns as are the bearing columns. They have eight bearing columns. They bear the weight of the roof, and then they have all the rest of the columns are decorative. Then they're called colonnettes of half columns, and they are essentially decorative, just so that this side of the temple doesn't look boring. And sure enough, it looks much prettier with this kind of decoration. Yet they make sure kind of to, uh, to show us that it, it does carry weight. So they have this frieze right there projecting and it's sitting on, on the capitals of the Ionic half colonnades. So there is an idea of support, even though this, uh, the frieze could very easily be there without support. But here it is. So here again, the combination of Etruscan and Greek influences. And uh, an even greater example, well, uh, a bigger temple. And in this case, it's a Corinthian temple as opposed to the Ionic temple. It lives in, uh, on the south of France, in the town of Nîmes. And this too comes from about um, the end of the first century BC. It is the same idea. The cellar is considerably longer than uh, the porch, but the porch still is, is quite deep. The uh, order is now the Corinthian order, and it goes around the whole temple as, um, as a decoration. This is the temple that uh, Thomas Jefferson saw when he was in the south of France, when uh, he was in France on, uh, on business of the New Republic, and when he saw it, his, uh, his life had changed. Immediately he recognized the greatness of classical architecture and, uh, and of course introduced that architecture in, um, in America and then already after his death, of course, when Washington was built, it was still built under his auspices and under his vision. And when we go to Washington DC, we have a lot of classical architectural buildings. Here again, uh, Maison Carré, the, a square, a square house it is called. It's not very square, but that's what it's called. Well, it's built on uh, perfect architectural principles, which depend on squares and circles and uh, the perfect proportion. So perhaps that's why it's called Maison Carré. Uh, the uh, ceiling in the portico right there, that was restored. That's 19th century restoration under Napoleon III, who was a nephew of uh, our first Napoleon, a lot of uh, restoration of uh, ancient monuments took place. And now we go to a Roman arch. I mentioned that when we talked about the Etruscans, that while the Greeks admired rectilinear architecture, the post and lintel architecture, the Etruscans embraced the arch and then the Romans adopted the same taste. And the Romans very much liked uh, the architecture with the arch. Now, if you remember, there, there, I mean, there could be many, many arches. But for our purposes here, we looked, when we looked at the um, Mycenaeans, we looked at the so-called corbel arch. And the corbel arch is constructed with, with each layer of masonry, masonry projected against the previous layer, and then it could be stopped anywhere and then carved to make an arch. And that's called a corbel arch. It could obviously be done as narrow and uh, pointed, or it could be stopped here and the impression of arch could be shaped. But then the true arch, a true arch must have a keystone right here a keystone and the so-called voussoirs, those trapezoid masonry pieces. And what happens is that in a true arch, you have a keystone and then these trapezoids projecting from it, and they all hold each other together because each exercises pressure on the other and that pressure counterbalance each other and they all, the, a true arch essentially sits by itself. The true arch holds itself together without mortar. Very easily, it could just be there without mortar. And thus, here we have it. When it is constructed, 
a centering is used right here a wooden centering is used but once this is all done the centering can very safely be taken away and the arch will hold so it has the springing posts right there and then the jams upon which the arch sits and this is a true arch now a true arch can be made into a barrel vault if it projects further it's just as a bit that the barrel vault is very heavy so therefore it presses out and the walls are in danger of collapsing as such the walls must be very thick and the fewer windows the better the solution to this which the Romans found was to take two barrel vaults like this and intersect them as a result of this intersection you see this is one barrel vault this is another barrel vault what's called groin vault is now created and all the pressure is directed to the corners and so long as these piers as they're called as this masonry that's holding up the vault is sufficient then the entire space is open up it's open up for air it's open up for light it's open up for walking so but these are the basic principles of Roman architecture soon enough Rome will uh, invent cement or concrete of which we will talk further but so here we have our tree, uh, true arch could be made into a barrel vault that barrel vault in fact could be turned or if a true arch is turned around itself we get a dome meanwhile here's another structure from about same time late first century BC that is part of an aqueduct. Now, Romans constructed brilliant aqueducts. Etruscans presumably uh, did that too, but not on the same scale. Roman aqueducts worked on gravity. In other words, they would find a source of water somewhere high in the mountains, and then their engineers would make sure that the water by gravity reached the city plentiful quantities of water, enough for fountains, enough for drinking water, enough for the famous Roman baths. And uh, most of the water went in uh, underground channels. But when they couldn't do them in case of rivers, they would build bridges. And then uh, those pipes would go inside the bridges, and as in this case, up on top there. But then the bridges would, of course, also be used uh, for transportation. And this is one of the uh, more beautiful ones, and it's called Pont du Gard, in other words, the bridge over the river Gard. It's a very shallow river, as you can see here, and often in the summer it dries up altogether. It is constructed, as you see, of three layers, and uh, the first story is the thickest, as you see here. And then the second is uh, not nearly as thick, and then the third is the same thickness as the second. What is astonishing here is, even though Romans did not have the same aesthetic as the Greeks did, they really didn't. But in this case, their sense uh, of aesthetic uh, certainly serves them well, because uh, while each large arch spans the other on the first story, then you have four smaller ones over a large one on the top story and in our terms it almost looks like a train is uh, going over the second story so aesthetically it's really beautiful and I can't imagine that they weren't aware of the fact that it reflects in the water and of course continues the impression it's done of rough unchiseled stone unpolished stone and in some cases masonry even projects through it because that facilitated uh, repairs that facilitated building of uh, scaffolding and uh, being able to uh, repair the structure uh, here you can see it it serves as a bridge in this case the river is dried up altogether it survives until today it's not an aqueduct today today it's just serves as a bridge. 
another aqueduct that goes back to uh, to the early centuries, first century AD, perhaps uh, the early second century AD, and that one is in Segovia, in Spain, and this consists now of uh, of two stories and it spans a valley as opposed to a river. When an aqueduct came to the city, here for instance, this is a reconstruction. Inside this city something more, something prettier would be done. In this case, uh, this is Porta Maggiore and this was done under the Emperor Claudius and the aqueduct itself, the pipes would be laid inside the gate the gate now, it's a two arch gates with two roads going through. And what's interesting in this case is that under Emperor Claudius, what the architects attempted to do is something different from the architects of Augustus, who inside the city itself built uh, impeccable, uh, well, Roman classical architecture. Here they are attempting to introduce the same sort of rough and hewn stone as was used on the aqueduct. And in this case what happens here is that this rusticated uh, unhewn stone is now used inside the city as well. Uh, these were all smooth but the arches here as you see a rusticated uh, type was used which is interesting which is uh, which is not classical, which is something very, very new. While the pediments and the Corinthian capitals are still well worked, but uh, the structures of the, um, uh, of the supports are not. And uh, on the uh, registers above, just says that Emperor Claudius had constructed this aqueduct for the, uh, for the people of Rome. But here, this is what you see here. This is the first time when this rustication now was introduced to the capital. Later in the Renaissance it will become extremely fashionable and um, a great deal of uh, civil buildings will be built with this rusticated uh, type.